morning CMSD scholars and caregivers and everyone watching today. Mrs. Gus and myself, Mrs. Fisher, would like to welcome you to Wednesday, May 27th reading segment of Games Through the Years. We are going to be taking a look at some very, very old games that kids used to play and take you through the early 1900s. And you're going to be able to see whether some of the games that you play today were around a very long time ago. Okay, so let's begin with the pledge. Hello everyone, please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, it's journal time. Can't start a Wednesday reading segment without starting with the journal. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to think about the games you played as a child. Which were your favorite games? Why? Think about as you're deciding which of the games that you loved, why was it that they were so fun? Okay, so I want you to use sensory details. All right, thinking about sight, taste, touch, smell, and hearing, thinking of all those describing words to describe the game you played when you were younger or still play, okay? Were any of them made up games? All right, so I want you to remember to use complete sentences and make sure you're showing someone and not telling them. The easiest way to do this is to remember if someone can close their eyes and you read aloud your journal to them, it should paint a picture in their head. Ghost in the Graveyard is our first game, and it's Mrs. Gus's favorite. So Ghost in the Graveyard is played with three or more friends or family members in any outdoor area, okay? So you can use your house, you can use your house and your neighbor's house if they let you. You can use the park. If you happen to have a graveyard nearby, this is a crazy cool game to play in the graveyard. It's especially fun at night in the dark, okay? The object of this game is to find the ghost, and that's the player who is hiding. Okay, the thing about this game is it's also a really cool exercise. All right, it's not only fun, but it's gonna get you moving. All right, it's an old game that's been handed down from one generation to another. There are several different ways to play, and you can research that on your own. There are lots of different methods to this. But the main objective is to pick a ghost, so one person will hide while the other players search. The ghost then tries to tag a player while the player tries to get back to home base. Okay, so very cool. Lots of exercise, lots of running, lots of screaming also as you're being tagged. Um, a quick spin on this that's fun is if you have flashlights. And um, those that are the players, if they are running around with flashlights, it's, uh, it's a different kind of fun twist on it. One of the best places to play outside games and learn new ones is Camp Fitch. Camp Fitch is in Pennsylvania and Scranton scholars went to Camp Fitch a couple times in the past couple years. And if you are loving what you're seeing, make sure in the fall you tell your teachers to look into a trip to Camp Fitch. All right, it's part of the international YMCA movement and has grown a lot since its founding in 1914 and is now located on the beautiful shores of Lake Erie. More than 16,000 people visit Camp Fitch for at least a few days every year through their summer camp, classroom field trips, retreats, and other outdoor adventures. Many campers come home explaining that they think it's the best place in the world. For the last couple of years, we've had the pleasure of collaborating with Tom Parker and his amazing staff. We asked them to put together a segment for all of our CMSC scholars to enjoy and to generate ideas that you can do at home this summer. Take a look. Hello and greetings from Camp Fitch YMCA. Today we're gonna to talk about summer and why we love summer and some cool things we can do during summer. So summer is my favorite time of the year, but sometimes I get so excited and then summer comes along and I just find myself getting bored because there's not much to do. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna show you 10 activities that will spark your curiosity this summer and give you some really activity, really some, some really cool activities to do. Come on.
So if you're bored and stuck at home and you really like to do DIY crafts or just use your, your left side of your brain to get creative, um, you can go and raid your recycling bin. Yes, that is right, your recycling bin and make some cool recycling bin crafts. So this right here, this is a desk organizer that was made out of a bunch of plastic water bottles um, and a big um, jug. And then they were all just like glued together and painted to make this really cute little desktop organizer. So you can do something like this with cardboard boxes or any other random recycling objects that you can find in your home. These are a great use and a great way to be environmentally friendly and repurpose these items so they don't go straight to a landfill. So that's one option. You can also do this really cool thing where um, you can actually learn how to weave with plastic bags. So one of my best friends, Tiffany, she made this hat um, from old plastic bags that she just had lying around her house and it, she learned how to knit with that plastic. So that's something that you can look up how to do online and you can learn how to make bags, you can learn how to make hats, you can learn how to make wallets, whatever your brain can possibly come up with. So um, go crazy, yeah, have, fi have fun, get wild and use those recyclable goods and get creative. So the world is a beautiful place even from your backyard, your window, your front porch, or even if you have a nearby neighborhood park. It's a beautiful place and there's a lot of really cool things going on. So what I want you to take note of the next time that you're outside or on your porch or on your front yard or your neighborhood, I want you to look for something that is multicolored. I want you to look for something that makes you laugh. I want you to look for the weirdest possible thing. I want you to find something that produces its own food and I want you to find three things that are man-made, okay? So I want you to go out, find those things, and bring a, a notepad and a pencil with you and keep, keep track of all of the really cool and awesome things you find, and then you can go home and share it with your family, your parents, your friends, things like that. If there's anything that you wanna to add to this list, feel free and add it and make it your own. Another really cool recycling project that you can do at home is build your own biodome. So a biodome is essentially a um, smaller version of what our entire biosphere is. A biodome is a mini ecosystem. So you can create one from the comfort of your home. All you need to get is a small um, container with a lid. So this isn't quite a biodome because as you can see, my plant has grown out of my jar. Um, but if this plant was closed inside, it would be considered a biodome. And all you need is water, some gravel, and some soil. Um, you put in a layer of rock, you add a layer of soil, you put in whatever plants that you can find um, into it, or seeds if you have them, pinto bean seeds or lentil beans. Those work really, really well if you have them at home. Um, you can plant them inside of the jar, add a little bit of water, and then seal her on up, and then watch your plant change and grow over time. It's basically like a mini planet Earth inside of a jar. So definitely a really cool thing to do at home. Another amazing activity that you can do at home that requires very little materials is make an at-home fishing pole. All you're gonna need for this is some long, thin string. You can use yarn or twine um, or, or just any, any old string you have laying around the house. And then you need a stick that's about a little longer than your arm length. So you just need a stick that's sturdy enough, so a little thicker than a twig, so it should be thicker than your finger and about the length of your arm. Then all you're gonna do is you're gonna take your string and tie it onto the fishing pole. All right, once you have your knot on your stick and you want that a little close to the end but not hanging off the end just like that. And then on the other end of your string, you can even tie some bait on. So if you want to dig up some worms or if you want to use some stale bread or some old hot dogs, anything like that, and you can just do a loop and tie it on the end. And then once you have your bait on and you, your, your pole is all tied up, ready to go, then you can go ahead and make your first cast. So if you're stuck at home and kind of bored, um, why not try making a few paper air airplanes? Um, the two basic rules I like to follow is um, making it symmetrical and making it simple, okay? You know, you kind of just want to make sure it all lines up and it's even on both sides. Using your creativity, try making a plane to the best of your ability and maybe 
testing and see how far it goes. Maybe test it against someone else's airplane to see how far theirs goes. Something you can do at home is skip some rocks. Make sure there's no one around you and you're looking for uh, rocks that have a flat side to them. The more pancake-like a rock, the better. The world record for rock skipping is used, uh, uses Lake Erie rocks. So if you're on Lake Erie, that's kind of cool. You're gonna make a little frisbee shape with your hand uh, and sometimes you'll get one skip and sometimes you'll get 12. Let's see what happens. Oh, nice, Brad. Oops, I didn't get any that time. One. Happy skipping. So if you have some free time to just chill out in your backyard or if you're going to the park or if you're just on your front porch or something like that, or even if you just have the opportunity to grab a couple of leaves while you're outside headed home, um, another really cool thing to do is to make your own nature art. And it's really simple. Um, basically, just find whatever you can in nature. Um, for this one, I'm gonna be picking some dandelions. 10 dandelions that I can find. This is actually really great because you can help your parents out by weeding the grass. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to arrange these dandelions in a pretty pattern until I come up with something that looks like this. And this is a small example, but if I were to take this and if I were to expand it so it went all the way across my yard, it would look really, really cool. So, you know, nature art can be something as simple as that. You can also use sticks. You can use other or leaves that you find around the house. Um, there's a lot of cool things that you can do. Um, you can also transfer this onto paper um, and press the flowers to keep them in your house um, or to make bookmarks or anything cool like that. Um, so you can get really creative. There's lots of resources online for nature. I would check those out. So at home you can try to identify some trees by printing out some tree identification resources online like what we have here. This tells us the leaf, the bud, the bark, and where the tree grows. And so we found this, this poplar tree. Uh, you can see how straight it is. And we matched the leaves up high with the leaves in the picture. Uh, this is a pretty identifiable tree uh, that you will be able to find at home. So happy tree hunting. Here we have a birch tree. It has this papery flaky bark. This is a yellow birch. Compared to a white birch, this has a little bit more of a yellow hue to it. When I was a kid, I used to peel off this bark and write notes to my brothers and friends on it. So that's something fun you could do if you wanted to. Flip over some rocks and logs, and this is something you can do anywhere. Let's see what we can find. I'm excited to see if there's anything under this rock. Huh, I don't see anything here. It looks like it's too dry. Let's go over to some of these rocks, or to some of these logs. Oh cool, I found an earthworm. Do you know if you cut these worms in half, they will regenerate? You can have a pot of soil or dirt, cut it in half, and whenever you dig up the dirt in a week, it will, you'll have two full worms instead of uh, two broken worms. So another really cool thing that you can do from home is start your own window garden. So all of these bags that I have over here um, are full of like beans and seeds and lentils that I just had in my pantry. So if you, you know, have a bunch of dry goods lying around, um, you can experiment with them and see which ones can sprout. Um, so you can try to sprout quinoa, you can sprout, um, like I said, lentils or any kinds of beans and they sprout actually pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> you can even grow a cat plant. Um, and another really cool thing um, is that once they sprout in the window, you can transfer them to some soil or to another container like this. And eventually you can actually transfer it so that it goes into the ground outside. And another really cool thing, you can also start gardens from food scraps in your home. If you have like an old piece of garlic clove or an onion or some old lettuce lying around, you can cut the top off and leave the root system intact and you can actually plant these um, into some little bits of soil or onto a paper towel and they'll start to sprout roots and so then you'll have your own little garlic plant or your own little lettuce. It's pretty fun. Enjoy, experiment, get out there, garden. Thank you all so much for joining us on our 10 ways to fuel your curiosity. I hope you have a lot of fun doing these activities and have a great summer exploring.
See you later. So now you've seen some really cool outdoor games from Camp Fitch. Let's take you back to the pioneer era, 1760 to 1850. Crazy long time ago. All right, so hide the thimble was a very popular game. You needed two players and a thimble or a small object. One player hides the thimble while the other closes their eyes and counts to at least 30. Then they try to find the thimble. So here's a fun fact. You might be thinking, what's a thimble? Well, when you play the game of Monopoly, one of the game pieces you choose from is a thimble. There it is. All right, so a thimble was used when sewing to protect your finger from getting poked. But if you take a look at the shape and size of the object, it's so super small, it makes for a very cool small object to hide. Next up is hoop rolling. Okay, so this is a crazy fun game and it is not easy. It is both a sport and a child's game in which a large hoop, like a hula hoop, is rolled along the ground, generally by means of an object wielded by the player. The aim of the game is to keep the hoop upright for long periods of time or to do various tricks. Not easy at all. Requires definite skill. All right, so this is kind of a cool thing. It's an ancient tradition, all right? It was widely dispersed among different societies. So in Asia, the earliest records date from ancient China and in Europe from ancient Greece. The most common materials for the equip equipment have been a wooden stick, all right, metal, maybe even an old bike wheel. Wooden hoops driven by a stick about one foot long are stuck with the center of the stick in order to ensure good progress. All right, so thinking about you're not using your hands, but you're actually using an object to roll it and keep it upright, it makes it kind of tricky. All right, so I want you to find something that you can hoop roll and I want you to give it a try. Super fun. So our next game is called Kick the Can. All right, so crazy fun game. How do you play though? Do you have an empty can and some open space? So open space can be your house, it can be a park across the street, but to play Kick the Can, a fun crossover of hide and seek and it's kind of like capture the flag. So you wanna avoid being captured at all costs while you attempt to free captured teammates by kicking the can in the center of the field. So what does it need? You need about five people, but more people make for more fun and an empty can or plastic bottle. So this is how you play. One person or a team of people, if the group is large, is considered it, and an empty can is placed in the open playing field. Okay, with eyes closed, it counts to an agreed upon number. So count to 10, count to 20, and then the other players run and hide, okay? That person then tries to find and tag each of the players, always keeping a watchful eye on the can. So you're looking for the players, but you gotta keep your eyes on the can. Any player who is tagged is sent to the jail, and that's usually a place that's in sight of the can, okay? The rest of the free players attempt to kick the can before being tagged out. If they to kick the can without being caught, they set all the captured players free. All right, so this is a game that requires a lot of skill when it comes to keeping an eye on all the people around you. So lots of fun. Kick the can can be played again at a park, it can be played in your front yard. It can be played just kind of any big open space. All right, so let's take a look and see exactly how this is played.
Next up is the game of Jax. So this is a very fun game and this game has been played forever. Ask your parents, ask your grandparents if they have played Jax. Okay, so what you need are a set of Jax and a ball and you really just need a smooth surface to play on. So the object of Jax is to be the first to go from onesies to tensies, all right? So you throw the Jax on the ground in front of you. You kinda wanna just scatter them. Make sure they don't land too far apart or too close together. All right, so here are the rules, but this is just kind of the basic way to play jacks. All right, you throw the ball in the air, you pick up one jack, then catch the ball after it bounces one time. Continue picking up the jacks one at a time. When you've collected all the jacks, throw them again and start picking up the jacks two at a time. Okay, so this is called twosies. When you get to threesies, you have to pick up three sets of three first, then pick up the leftover jack. Continue until you are at tonsies. All right, you then declare the winner as to the first one to tens, or go back again to ones. All right, so think about it. At the end, you have to bounce the ball and be able to collect all 10 jacks in your hand. That's how you would win the game. All right, your turn continues until you either miss the ball fail to pick up the jacks, move a jack, or drop a jack that you have picked up. Your turn is then over and the next person goes. All right, the cool thing about jacks is it's a game that you can play by yourself as well. You can just continue to practice by picking up one at a time, then two at a time, then three at a time until you get to 10. So you can play with multiple people, but you can also play alone. All right, so let's take a look and see how this is played. In this segment, I'm going to talk to you about the idea behind the game. You use one of your hands, you grab all your jacks, you throw them out just like that. I have a nice even spread, like I said earlier. And you're going to use the same hand you use to spread out your jacks, and you're going to bounce your ball with that hand. That's the hand you use to bounce your ball, and that's the hand you use to pick up all your jacks, too. So, like this, if you were going to bounce your ball, grab one jack, and pick it up with the same hand. See how I caught it in the same hand? I've already got one jack, so now I'm going to go for two. Bounce your ball, use the same hand, and now I've got it. I've got my one and I've got my two. Next I would go for my three and my four, and then my five. But I'm gonna go ahead and move my three and my four off to the side, just like this, and I'm gonna show you how fun and entertaining when you get to the end it is. I throw it up, I try to grab all five. See how hard it is? It's really hard and it takes a lot of skill, but practice makes perfect, and that is the idea behind Jax. So now we're going to go back to the 1900s. All right, so in the early 1900s, kids were expected to keep themselves busy, to entertain themselves. All right, there wasn't money for expensive toys. And back in this time, you need to think that TV wasn't around, there weren't technology, there were no computers, there weren't any kind of video games, none of that was around. So you really were creating games that could be played with almost no materials, all right? So a lot of times there wasn't a ton of traffic. So the street was kind of kids' playgrounds, the roads, pavements, and the tiny front gardens that were around. All right, so the first game is called Knocking Down Ginger. All right, Knocking Down Ginger was the name of the game in which kids knocked on someone's front door and then ran away. Okay, so I know that game has been named a number of different th things through the years, but think about it. Back in the 1900s, you would run away and nobody would be recording you. Today, you do that and everyone's recording you. Okay, so the next one is a cool one. It's called Swimming on, Swimming, Swinging on Lamp Post Crossbars, all right? If someone had a long enough length of rope, they would throw the rope over the crossbar of a lamp post, the bar where the lamp lighter would lean his ladder. Then kids take turns to hold both ends of the rope and swing from it. Okay, so you gotta think, this was a time when those lamps were lit by someone each night. So the crossbar was meant for the, the man ladder to lean against it so he could climb up the ladder and light the light all right but kids would throw a rope over it and then they would swing from it all right very cool two games from the early 1900s 
Play based around physical objects has always been an important aspect of the life of the playground. Adults may fondly remember objects they used for play, such as tops and hoops in pre-war Britain, or marbles, five stones, jacks and conkers in the post-war decades. As the Opis put it, the youthful pleasure of prizing a mahogany smooth chestnut from its prickly casing is not easily forgotten. Marbles, rather differently, is one of the playground games with the most ancient history, traceable back to second century Greece. The Opis record the rich variety of names for different kinds of marbles. Pop alleys, glasses, ballsers, dummocks, jarries, moral leggers, bullies, bumpers, cannons, dobbers, gobbies, fighters, fobblers, kings, slammers, smashers, tatty mashers, yogis, babies, peas, peewees, peedies, titchers, or tiddlers, blood alleys, cat's eyes, coca-colas, pearlies, rainbows, frenchies, and spiders. Other games involved designed structures, such as the hopscotch grid chalked by girls on pavements and playground tarmac. Many of these are not to be found in today's playgrounds, though it's quite possible that they may unpredictably revive as crazies. If the actual objects of play go in and out of fashion, the deeper motives for playing with objects continue undiminished. Games involving throwing, catching, flicking, bouncing and knocking down various objects can still be seen, even if the materials involved are different. Collecting is still a passion of children, and some of the objects of collection closely resemble those of the mid-20th century, such as trading cards based on football, like the match attacks cards we observed on our playgrounds. OK, CMSD scholars, it's writing time. So today, you are going to design a new outside game that does not involve technology in chronological order okay so in time order clearly write the directions make sure you go over these several times to make sure they make sense grab a family member or friend and try it okay when you're done once you've played the game write a two paragraph reflection explaining what worked what didn't work and how you can make improvements for next time all right so we hope you've enjoyed this segment on games we hope it welcomes you to the summer, and we can't wait to see you next week as we talk about Shakespeare. Yo, E, I checked out that mixtape, man. That joint is awesome, man. We gotta make a video. Yeah, let's do it. It's mathematics, mathematical symbols and signs. The most complex becomes simple with time. Mathematics, mathematics. see what you find when you start to look for it with a disciplined mind. Mathematics, mathematics. logic and proof that is used to determine mathematical truth. It's mathematics. it's mathematics, step in the class, and by the time the bell rings, I hope you're ready for math. It's mathematics. In the right triangle, given two sides, use the Pythagorean theorem you can find. Unknown value, so you have three. Label all the sides with an A, B, and C. Yo, looking for the C? This is where you find me. I am that side right across from the 90 degrees. The angle with the little square. Shaped like an L for the legs that are there. If we call the legs, what we call the third side. It's the hypotenuse. Say it if you heard it right. Hypotenuse. Longer than the other two. So to find the missing side, here is what you're gonna do. Set up this equation. See, it's on its own. Of the three numbers, it is always alone. It goes A squared, yeah. Plus B squared, yeah. Yo, equals C squared, yeah. That's right. Use the Pythagorean theorem you can find. Unknown value, so you have three. Label all the sides with an A, B, and C. In the right triangle, given two sides. Use the Pythagorean theorem you can find. Unknown value, so you have three. Label all the sides with an A, B, and C. A squared, yeah. Yo, plus B squared, yeah. Equals C squared, yeah. That's right, yeah. Use this equation when you find the your side. Yo, here's a way to do it when you're giving both legs. Square them, add them, see what you get. Take the square root of that, that's the last step. 
Now you just found the high pot and new stride. It's a little different when one leg is missing. Set up the equation, everything in its position. Square the high pot and new same for the leg. Subtract the smaller number from the bigger ones and get down to this last step. Take the square root. So I'm pretty sure that you know what to do, right? It's the last step. Take that square root. Now I'm pretty sure that you know what to do, right? In the right triangle, give it two sides. Use the Pythagorean theorem, you can find unknown value. So you have three. Label all the sides with an A, B, and C. In the right triangle, give it two sides. Use the Pythagorean theorem, you can find unknown value. So you have three. Label all the sides with an A, B, and C. Hi, my name is Tamara Zelwin, and I am a 7th and 8th grade math teacher at Orchard STEM School. Today, I am going to be teaching you a lesson on the Pythagorean Theorem and its application to the real world. Enjoy the lesson! Before we do anything, let's go over some vocabulary. The Pythagorean Theorem only applies to right triangles. In the picture, you see an example of a right triangle. The legs of a right triangle are labeled A and B. The third leg, labeled C, is a, has a special name called the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always located directly across from the right angle of a right triangle. So notice that the Pythagorean Theorem is written as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, let's do an example. For this example, we are using an aerial view of a street intersection. As you can see from the diagram, we have Orchard Avenue, which is four miles, intersected at a right angle by Bailey Avenue, which is three miles. Orchard Avenue and Bailey Avenue are the two legs of the right triangle. Apple Avenue, which is the hypotenuse, is labeled leg C. What is the length of Apple Avenue? So looking at our example, as we said, Orchard Avenue is four miles, and that is leg A. Bailey Avenue is three miles, and that is leg B. What is leg C? So if we take A, which is 3, and we square it, and 4, which is B, and we square it, that will equal C squared. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals C squared. So 3 squared is equal to 9, and 4 squared is equal to 16. Don't get confused because 3 squared or 3 to the second power is not 3 times 2. It's 3 times itself twice or 3 times 3. And 4 to the second power is not 4 times 2. It is 4 times itself twice or 4 times 4. So again, 3 squared is 9 and 4 squared is 16. So 9 plus 16 equals C squared. So 
So 9 plus 16 is equal to c squared, so therefore c squared is equal to 25. Don't forget, we don't want the value of c squared. We actually want the value of c. So in order to find the value of c, we need to find the square root of c squared and find the square root of 25. So c is equal to the square root of 25. And the square root of 25 is 5. Therefore, Apple Avenue is five miles long. In the first example, you were given legs A and B. But what if you were given leg A and leg C and needed to find the value of leg B? What would you do then? So in our second example, we're talking about the hill's distance. The hill's distance is 17 feet, as you see from the diagram. The distance from the bottom of the hill to the base of the elevation is 15 feet and is labeled as such. What is the hill's elevation? Notice that le leg B is labeled, and we know that C is 17 because it is directly across from the right angle. Therefore, letter A, or leg A, is the value of 15. So in this example, leg B is unknown, so we need to find out the value of leg B. We know that A is 15, so we substitute in 15 for the value of A, and that becomes 15 squared plus the unknown, which is B squared, equals, in this case, C, which is 17 squared. So 15 squared plus B squared equals 17 squared. So the value of 15 squared is 225. We still do not know the value of B or B squared. And the value of 17 squared is 289. In order to get the b squared by itself, we need to do something differently in this example. We will need to subtract the 225 from both sides of the equation to get the b squared by itself. So we will do 225 minus 225 on the left side, and those will cancel out, and then 289 minus 225 on the right side. Since the 225s cancel out and make a zero, that leaves the b squared by itself on the left side of the equation. 289 minus 225 is equal to 64. So our simplified equation is b squared equals 64. Again, we do not want to find the value of b squared. We want to find the value of b. So we need to find the square root of b squared and the square root of 64. The square root of b squared is b, and the square root of 64 is 8. So therefore, b is equal to 8 feet. The elevation of the hill is 8 feet. So let's try a harder one now. In our third example, we have a window that is 4 meters from the ground. If I place a ladder 10 meters away from the base of the house, how long does the ladder need to be to reach the window? Looking at our diagram, we can see that the side of the house is labeled and the ground is labeled. 
those are legs A and B. We don't know the latter, so we have labeled that C. And because the latter is directly across from the right angle, the latter is going to be our hypotenuse. As we said, letter A is equal to four, and letter B is equal to 10. So four squared plus 10 squared equals C squared. We know that four squared, which is A, is equal to 16, and 10 squared, which is B, is equal to 100. So 16 plus 100 is equal to C squared. Well, now let's add 16 and 100, and we get 116. So C squared is equal to 116. Since we do not know the value of C, we can use the value of C squared to figure it out. Again, we're going to find the square root of 116 and the square root of C squared. The square root of C squared is C. The square root of 116 is not a perfect square, so this time we're going to have to estimate, and it's going to be about 10 and 77 hundredths, which means that the latter needs to be about 10 and 77 hundredths meters long to reach the top of the side of the house where the window is located. We have one final example. In our final example, we have a field. And in the field, children were playing a running game with bases. One child ran from base one to base two. Another child ran from base one to base three. What is the distance from base three to base two in the diagram? Notice that base between base one and base two, it's directly across from the right angle. So therefore, it is the hypotenuse. 14 is letter B and A is labeled letter A. We need to find the value of letter A. We don't know the value of A, so we will leave that as A squared. Since the value of B is 14, we substitute that in and get 14 squared. And C is equal to 16, so we have 16 squared. So A squared plus 14 squared equals 16 squared. Let's simplify this. A squared stays the same because we don't know its value yet. 14 squared is equal to 196, and 16 squared is equal to 256. So A squared plus 196 equals 256. This is looking very similar to our previous example. Again, we need to find the value of A squared. So in order to get A squared by itself, we need to subtract 196 from both sides. Once we subtract 196 from the left side, we are left with A squared because 196 minus 196 is zero. On the right side of the equation, when we subtract 256 minus 196, we get 60. So A squared equals 60. However, we do not want the value of A squared. We want to find the value of A. So we need to find the square root of A squared and the square root of 60. The square root of a squared is a. The square root of 60 is not a perfect square, so we have to estimate. 
so the square root of 60 is about equal to 7.7. .7. As you can see, the distance from base three to base two is about seven and seven tenths feet. So in conclusion, we have done four different examples of how to find a missing value using the Pythagorean theorem in four different types of real life examples. So now, I'm going to let you watch how Andriana Williams demonstrates this in her real life scenario. Take it away, Anna. Hello, my name is Andriana Williams, and today I will be showing you how to use the Pythagorean theorem in everyday life. The materials that you will need are a window on the side of your house, a ladder, a measuring tape, yardstick or any other device that you can use to measure. First, you need to measure the ladder. The ladder I'm using is six feet. Next, you will need to take the ladder and lean it underneath the window. Make sure that the top of the ladder is touching the bottom of the window. One thing that you need to know about the Pythagorean theorem is that it only works on right triangles. Next, I will measure the distance between the house and the bottom of the ladder. That measures to three feet. If you follow me over here, I will show you the math. There are three things that you need to know about the Pythagorean Theorem. One, as I previously stated, the Pythagorean Theorem only works on a right triangle. Two, it is fairly easy to remember, and the formula for it is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The last thing that you need to know is that for the Pythagorean Theorem to work, you need to know these terms, hypotenuse, adjacent, and opposite. The opposite would be the ground to the house. The hypotenuse would be the diagonal side of the right triangle, which in our case would be our ladder. And the adjacent is the house or window to the ground. Now, our opposite or the ground would be three feet. Our ladder or hypotenuse would be six feet. Our unknown is our wall. So what we would have to do is say our unknown plus three squared equals six squared. So pretty much to break it down, it would be our unknown is equal to 36 minus nine. If you do the math, our unknown is 27. The square root of 27 is about 5.2. Our check step, plug it in. 5.2 squared plus three squared is equal to what? So, 5.2 squared should be equal to 27.04, and our 3 squared, as previously mentioned, should be equal to 9. If you add those together, you should get 36.04, which is about equal to, two, to 6 squared, which is equal to 36. So because 5.2 brings us close to 6, squared or 36 we know that we have the correct answer thank you for watching hi everybody today we're going to be talking about geometry and art again and specifically the math concepts of tessellations if you want to see an artist with an amazing grasp of that subject, you need to check out MC Escher. Here's the website. Tessellations is a concept where 
you take a shape and you repeat that shape to cover a surface where nothing overlaps and there's no space left behind. Pentagons are a polygon that will tessellate. Notice there's no extra spaces, no overlap. But not all polygons will tessellate. These hexagons require the shape of a square in between them to get them to tessellate. We're going to have fun with this concept now. We're going to create our own shape that will tessellate. To do that, what you first need to have is a square. Obviously, squares tessellate very well. They fit together edge to edge with no extra spaces and no overlap. Now what you're gonna have to do is change this square so that it will fit more like a puzzle piece and have more design to it. So we're going to keep this flat edge the way it is and my design is gonna go corner to corner. It doesn't really matter what you do. as long as that edge stays the same. And then I'm going to cut on this line. Okay, so I've now cut that apart. What you want to do without flipping this or changing it, you're going to just bring this shape down right here, corner to corner, and you're going to tape it there so that it stays. Now, what I'm going to want to do is to change this so that it fits in this way too. I'm gonna go from the corner because it's gonna be easier for me to fit it to my other side. Once I cut this out, I'm gonna slide it over and match up this corner with this corner over here. And that's my tessellating puzzle piece. We want to take this piece now and create a, a piece of artwork with it. So we're going to use this to trace onto another sheet of paper in all directions because it will now fit top, bottom, side, side and fill the paper. So you're covering your surface with a shape that fits into itself without overlapping or leaving any negative space behind. That's tessellating. When deciding how to trace this, it doesn't matter if you trace it this way or that way or however you wanna do it. So when I look at it, I might wanna decide beforehand what this might be um, and then trace it. You know, if I turn it this way, it kinda of looks like an elephant with a long nose, so I might wanna trace it that way or, you know, cat with wings. I kinda of like that idea. So I think I'm gonna trace that way and also the best way to start is right in the middle. So you can see I've traced it one time. Now I'm going to go ahead and find how that fits and trace all the way around, all the way around. It will fit all the way around. And this is what it looks like when it's done. Now what you have to do is really look at this and decide if you can see anything in that. Whatever it is that you see, you have to make other people see. So now you're gonna go back in and you're gonna add the details to that so that other people can understand what you're trying to get across. A good idea is to trace your shape out a couple of times and play with the ideas. It really is worth it to do more than just one idea. So here was my first one, kind of a cat with wings. Here's another one. All of these are all in the same direction, but you might need to turn yours to see what it does in different ways. So here's my other one, kind of ghosty things. And then my third one, is an octopus playing with a starfish or a sea star. If you choose a complicated design, you're probably going to want to trace it into each space rather than having to redraw all the details each time, although that could be nice. No one says that each one of these has to be exactly like the other. 
But to make it easier, I have a light table. This is a light table. They're super thin, super cheap. Um, I got mine on Amazon, I think for 15 bucks. But a favorite of mine is the window. So if you don't have a light table, which probably most people don't, um, I suggest you use your window and you can use that like a light table to see through your work so that you can trace. Remember when you're creating your designs that you can't change the outside of your design. That has to stay the same. You can only change what's on the inside. So here's your finished design. I know it looks crazy complicated, but if you consider that you're just manipulating a square and then once you've decided what your design would be, you're just tracing it again and again and again. Just like many geometric designs, tessellations can be found in nature. Bees do it all the time. Many artists besides MC Usher found tessellations interesting. If you'd like to see more, check out Islamic tile art. A lot of Islamic art is non-pictorial. That means no people, no animals, no plants and things like that. It's design-based. So they have beautiful tiles and beautiful glasswork and just amazing textiles. It's something that everybody should check out. Thanks for tuning in. I'd love for you to give this a try and I'll see you next time.